Now, okay, so, so, but, no, but tell us, so it's good for us, it's also good for society. Um, tell us, but, but tell us why philanthropy needs a revolution. Ah, yes, well, uh, th this is a, um, uh, it needs a revolution because of a revelation that I had about um, really over the last 10 is that, years. Is that, a, is that a Hamilton illusion? You like that? I, yes, it is, of course. Thank All you right. very much for noticing. <laughs> uh, so I, um, so, so as, as, as you said, I, I didn't grow up as a donor. I wasn't on what I call the list. I wasn't the regular person who gives everywhere. My parents just were regular middle-class people. And we would give, okay, you know, we'd give to the school and we'd give to the Girl Scouts and things. But the idea of somebody you know, calling us over and over again uh, and, and saying, give us money, give us money. It didn't even happen. So I didn't really know about this world. Uh, and, and I think that I have perspective, as you mentioned earlier, because I came from business. And when I dropped into kind of like an alien into this world of, of, of really major donor giving and giving in general, I realized that, um, well, A, that I felt like an alien, which was strange, but I also realized that all the not all, most of the basic business tenets that I knew and business practices didn't exist in these nonprofits. And I thought that was very strange. Like I couldn't understand why. And in fact, on multiple occasions, I was told by people at these nonprofits, don't ever use the word business around here. And, and that's kind of like a little bit crazy. So I, I thought that was, um, that was very strange. Hold on, they just did something to my screen, sorry. Um, okay, and um, I, I was uh, sort of alarmed. And, and anyway, we started to give, we found that it was extremely difficult to give uh, because people were, um, they didn't believe us. They didn't believe we had money. They didn't bother checking. They just basically said, you're not a regular donor, therefore we're not gonna treat you as somebody who has money. And we've, as, as those of you who read the book or those of you who will read the book, you'll, you'll see that, that we started off, when we first became wealthy, the first thing we thought was, uh, we, we really, you know, who are we going to give this to? And I think there's a little bit of guilt about that when that happens, but it was very awkward. And uh, so we decided we wanted to give money to a couple institutions, some very large gifts um, at the beginning. And, and we were treated like we were, you know, just people off the street who, which I guess we were, uh, but, but not with, uh, they basically just didn't believe us. They didn't believe us. They, um, in one instance, um, I told somebody we were giving a large gift and the person called my husband to ask if we were, uh, he was on board with that, which was a bit strange. Um, so there's um, uh, a lot of things that were just really, really alien to us. Anyway, as I started down that path and I thought, wait a minute, these people are all doing good work, but the way they do it is, is completely contrary to anything that I would have thought would be the way they do it. But then what happened is uh, a major uh, donor here in Los Angeles passed away. And already I feel like this is this alien world and I'm trying to figure out, find my way through it. And by the way, there's a lot of people like me who suddenly had a lot of money and we're all, it turns out, I've done a lot of checking. Most of us are all treated the same way, that we just don't exist and that our money isn't really welcome here. It's really for somebody else, which, which then makes me really sad. And I'm, I know it makes you sad too, because you ran a nonprofit for a while. And, and, and it's, it's like, wait a second, we're all sitting there banging on doors, trying to raise money. And yet the organiz there's organizations that are saying, oh no, you're not welcome because you're not one of the people that we know. So, but then I found out that there were, a, a, this, this major a donor in Los Angeles passed away. He was in his nineties. And um, he said, to, and, and after he died, uh, somebody from one of the big organizations he gave to said to my husband, we don't know what we're going to do. Now this is man in his probably late nineties. Um, and he said, we don't know what we're going to do because he was responsible for 60% of our organization's income. And yeah, right. I was like, what the heck? I don't understand. That could, that would never fly in the business world. And you had plenty of notice. It's not like the man was 30 years old and whatever. You, you knew this was coming. So I thought, wow, that is really unbelievable. So I started looking at other institutions and large uh, nonprofit institutions. And I realized that there were a whole lot of people in their 80s and 90s who were major donors there. And in fact, I also realized in doing some checking that a major part of the revenue of a lot of these was it, it, more than the 80-20 rule. It was maybe 90% was from these few, these few, I call them the old white men, but they basically are no, uh, no disrespect to older white gentlemen, but, but that's really what it is. And they, and, and I always imagine them to be like the original Mary Poppins. If any of you remember that movie where you have the, the old guys marching around the bank and they're, they're really scary and they're trying to get them, pry the money out of a little boy's hand. And that's what I felt like this world was, which 
is not compelling, does not make me want to go like find lots of new nonprofits. So I thought, I thought this is really, really crazy. But then I realized that this was the same everywhere. It was the same, not just in Los Angeles, it was the same everywhere. And that these this small group of older people, much older people were controlling or, or certainly providing the funding for a lot of these organizations. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, those organizations in the big, big ones are responsible for a number of other organizations that they fund completely or largely, who then fund other organizations, who then fund organ other. So any one of these big organizations might fund a hundred or a thousand little organizations. And what would happen if a, like another one of these guys died and they were responsible for 40 or 60 or 70%, all of a sudden, all these little organizations who don't even know about the guys up at the top, they just won't get a check and they're done. And I couldn't live with that. So I said, look, at, I'm find myself in a position where I don't have to work um, and, and I'm super interested in, in, in doing good. And, and yet the, this, this sector seems to be kind of screwed up. So, okay, really screwed up. So I decided that they needed a revolution. There needs to be major change. Uh, found out that the way that nonprofit fundraising is done was actually the methodology was created over 100 years ago. I found this out from a professor in the UK who teaches the history of philanthropy. And I thought, well, how many other things are there that haven't changed in 100 years? That's pretty amazing. So, um, so then I, and then I realized that it really is kind of obvious what needs to be done. It's just that nobody does it that way because thousands and thousands of people, or as you probably saw in the earlier slides, there's one and a half million organizations. There's millions of people who work for nonprofits. And if they've all been told, oh no, ignore the people who just ha had a you know, liquidation event and had money, just go ask those guys for a little bit more money, then this sector's in big trouble. And I just couldn't live with that. So I did a lot of studying, talked to a lot of academics, found a lot of research and tried to create, oh, and I also found out the donors don't talk. So donors, I think because they don't wanna be thought of as whiny white people or whiny rich people, they just don't complain. You just, they, they talk maybe, don't even talk to each other. And so I thought, well, I'll go find a few books and see what donors have written. And I found out there are no books that donors have written. So I realized, you know what? People on the fundraising side and on the donor side and on the board side need to realize, need to understand and have a book that shows what's the donor's perspective and what's the perspective of, of you know, donors all over, in this case, all over the world. And uh, so I wanted to create the ultimate guidebook for this donor side of the equation of what does it feel like to be have resources want to give and then go through these the system so one of the issues you bring up in your book is the is the, this whole issue of, of donor advised funds and some of the policy challenges is something that really intrigued me can can you can you spend a little time for for folks who may not be uh, fully familiar tell us about donor advised funds and why should nonprofits care about them Okay, so uh, nonprofits should care about them because I'm looking for the number. As of 2019, a 2020 report of 2019, we haven't gotten a 2020 report yet, um, or, or for that year, there was $142 billion in donor advised funds. I just wanna say that again, $142 billion. All of that money, uh, for all, in the case of all, all of that money, and this is just in the US, there are some donor advised funds in other countries. Uh, they are, uh, the, the person who's given the money or given the money, uh, it's a special IRS piece that I, I know you're aware of and some of the people on the call might be, uh, but it allows you to get the full tax benefit when you give the uh, either money or in my case, we do appreciated stock. And then the, the, the and the, really this is all it is. People have heard about donor advised funds. It's not that difficult. So a donor advised fund is a place where you, if you get, let's say you, uh, we had a liquidation event like we did and you don't want to go figure out where to put all the money right away. And, and so you just put it in this thing and in this fund, there some are run by uh, community foundations, and some are run by um, uh, individual nonprofits, and some are run by big banks. And and that allows you to. And, and and the deal is that you can advise on where the money goes. Technically, most organizations will send to any qualified 501c3. Uh, we'll send the money on to them, and they will send either a, pay, a payment via ACH or check on your behalf. It says from your fund, but you don't own the rights to that money anymore. You own the rights to advise that money, but the, but they can't, the bank can't just take it. They, it, it sort of stays there in perpetuity. So, uh, so for, for, for uh, nonprofits, it's great. It's just another place to get money from. So it's, it's another place where people happen to send their money this way. For me, it's great because a, I don't have to make a bunch of decisions when the money comes, if it comes in here and there, you know, you sell stock every couple of years or whatever it is. Um, but I also have one place to do all of the accounting work. So I don't have to take all of the different, put that list at the end of the year and figure out who did I give to. It's all coming through that fund. 
So if the accounting is super, super easy, they do charge a small fee for managing that. And they're also responsible for making sure that I don't try to give to somebody who's not a 501c3, not a registered nonprofit. And so it kind of protects me a little bit too. And the really nice thing about the community foundation funds is that a percentage of my little percentage that I pay, those all add up in this hundred and something billion dollars, those go back into that, into that community that you're supporting. So in the case of uh, the Jewish Community Foundation that I was involved in, I was told it was a double mitzvah because you were actually giving money to the organization. And then from your fee, that also went back into the community. So that you pay a little extra for that if you want to do it. So the downside of it is that they're, um, they're uh, very opaque and, um, and all these nonprofits want to be in front of those donors and they can't. There, there's nowhere where there's a list published of here's all the people who own these donor advised funds. You don't even know who they are unless you happen to get a check from them. Mm. And some of them are under a different name. So you would think that the people who run the donor advised funds would be charitable. These are the, the big organizations and, and they would want to tell the, um, the people who own these donor advised funds, the, the donors, they would want to say, oh, I, hey, I just found this. So you're interested in kids' causes. I just found this great organization that, that uh, it, you know, it, it works with kids and they do a great job. You should know about it. But the, so I couldn't understand for several years, why don't these big community foundations and why don't the bank, why doesn't anybody say, here's all the wonderful new nonprofits and do that? And until I realized that that little fee that you pay um, is a percentage of what's in the fund. And so why would you want, why would a bank want to say we have less funds now than we had last year, which is what the result would be. So the way it's set up, and it was set up in, a, in, in some small part around the turn of the century, but mostly in the 70s. Um, so, it, and it just grows exponentially every year. That's, uh, that's a real problem is that there isn't visibility that way. Um, the other problem that I heard, um, and it's part of this, um, the Grassley Act that they're trying to put through in Congress, uh, is that there are some foundations who will give their 5% because there's five foundations have a 5% base requirement to give at least 5% every year. And basically they all give 5%, most of them. But donor advised funds have no requirements. So you could have the money sit there for years and that makes people a little crazy. And then I also found out through this new, new uh, piece of legislation that, the, uh, that many of the foundations are taking their 5% requirement and putting it into a donor advised fund and then waiting a few years and sending it from the donor advised fund back to the foundation. And then nobody in the sector um, benefits. So I, I thought that was a little crazy myself. And of course, you in your case, you had a whole situation where you went in with a with a with with one of these funds, and then of course the found you know the the charity that was running the fund didn't allow you to spend money on what you wanted to spend money on. That's right, and I was totally shocked. I've been using it for quite a while. And by the way, one of the easy parts about it, and I suggest that everybody opens a donor advice fund so you can really see this for yourself. Uh, but I'm able to have a meeting with somebody across the table or across Zoom and pick up my phone and immediately within, it takes me maybe two minutes, give the money to that organization or request it. And the organization, the person sitting across from me immediately gets a confirmation saying, hey, Lisa just recommended this amount. And a week or two later, they get it, they get the money. And that's really efficient. And I can't do that with with typical fundraising, you know, everybody has their own different thing on the uh, on the web, and so this way I can just do it from my smartphone. Um, but what happens is I was in a situation just like that, and I actually got the confirmation, and then I got a phone call saying we can't do this. And uh, they had a very vague policy statement. I asked for their policy statement. Uh, this doesn't happen as much with the big banks. The big banks, it's a five hundred one c three, and that's kind of it. They don't want to be involved beyond that. Um, but but there is some issue, there are some issues about what are you funding? You know, what other things is this group that I'm part of funding? And for that reason, I, I created uh, my own with a couple of uh, people I know uh, in a nonprofit that I'm really involved in. We created our own donor advice fund that had very, very specific, uh, very explicit um, uh, uh, rules on what they will fund and what they what, what they will allow to go through their fund and what they won't. And in our case, it's just anything that hurts somebody else or, you know, uh, breeds hate or whatever. We won't we won't allow those checks to go through. But right. it's a, it's a, it's an interesting um, it, and, and some people don't like the donor advice funds because of that, too. But I think the problem with the donor advice funds is is more about how do we get that money out of them and into the um, into the society, right. into the sector. Yeah. OK, um, you talk about so many things in the book. One of the things you really get into uh, is millennial giving. I, I was super interested. Um, what what do you see as uh, what 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 are some trends in millennial giving that may be different from previous uh, from previous generations, 
and um, and maybe you can talk a little bit in that context with with yeah, sure. the nonprofit models like like resource generation, for example. Yeah. Okay. So if you're not familiar with resource generation, I suggest that everybody looks that up. It's an interesting organization that is supposed to be kind of hush hush, and two of my kids are part of it, and they probably won't love that I'm saying this, but resource generation has now been out in the press the last year or two. It's been around. Wait, wait, for- why, why is this supposed to be hush hush? I don't know because I'm not a member because I'm too old to be a member. It's people between 21 and 35. But uh, my guess is that the minute that they people know these their, their names, they're going to get the, you know, 102 whatever emails and phone calls saying, give me, give me, give me. And they just don't want to be in that position. So I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And in fact, these are typically people who um, are, are uh, their parents were really wealthy and they have a, the, the, the typical scenario is that the father, the parents say, or the attorney says, you're going to have a meeting with the attorney, you're turning 21. And then they say, okay, here's a whole bunch of money. And guess what? You're really rich. And then they get really shocked that their kid bought a Ferrari. So uh, that's, that's, but that's really what it's about. And a lot of those kids, they, they don't want to be looked like, looked at that way. They want to understand what they're giving to. They want to have giving be part of what they do. It's People who want, I mean, and, and this is a big, uh, uh, really a, a, almost a post-COVID thing as well. People want purpose in their life. And whether it's going to a new job or it's giving, they want to do something with purpose. And they want to be having good information. They want to understand what they're giving to. And so in the past, the older donors, uh, I, the way that they would do it very often is they would say, okay, yeah, that looks good. Or you're a friend of a friend. And they'd give them a check and say, yeah, okay, you'll come back next year, you know, send me your annual report. And that does not fly anymore at all. Uh, in fact, um, millennials are actually extremely willing to give. All of the stuff people say that they don't want, they only care about themselves, has proven to not be true. And But they want to give maybe as a volunteer first, and then they may, might give money. And that didn't happen in previous generations. So, and a lot of the organizations will say, oh no, the volunteers are the people who don't have the money to give, so why are you doing that? So that's already different. And they want to know how... Um, what, you know how the how the organization is doing relative to their mission. They want they want data. They want to know as it happens. They don't want to wait for an annual report. In fact, they don't want an annual report at all. They want to have a relationship with that nonprofit, and that is really wholly different. And it's also the nonprofits weren't ready for that. So their idea about when we first started giving, and we said we're only going to give to organizations that we also have something to do with in terms of volunteering or providing advice to or something. And um, there were a number of organizations that just were not comfortable with that at all. And those guys are not going to be around in five or 10 years because the millennials are, uh, and, and there are, you might've seen the, the notice I had earlier, there's 618,000 millennial millionaires right now in the United States, about 42%, 44% of them are in California. Do you want, so, do you want to, so, to maybe rad, do you want to put up that slide? Is it, you, which slide yeah. is that? Yeah, maybe you can. There's a slide that, that shows this. And, and, People, it just blows people's minds. I believe that number is closer to 700, 750,000 now while he's looking for the slide. Um, and so when I ask people, how many of those millennial millionaires, and just being clear, they're millionaires, sometimes they're multimillionaires, many of them don't have families yet. And, and uh, he'll get to the slide in a minute, if you can go to the next slide. And uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. This just shows how gigantic the industry is. Keep going, it's the next one, there you go. Um, so there's 618,000 millennial millionaires, again, in the U.S. alone. And when I ask people, how many of those do you have on your board, knowing millennials are now up to 40 years old, right? The answer I always get is, everybody knows what the answer is probably, it's zero. And when I finally, I, 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 that's what people say. It's like, oh, well, they can't afford it. Or I hear people saying, let's go after that 32-year-old who has money because maybe he can then introduce us to his father. And that's insulting. And it's inappropriate. And it also isn't the right thing for the organization. So, but the hard part and the reason why a lot of nonprofits aren't spending a lot of time with millennials as much as they want to is I think they don't understand them. They haven't taken the time to understand that these are not, you know, whiny people asking for crazy things. In general, they're people who really want to exhibit gratitude and want to be part of this, but just want to ask questions. And and there's no reason in the world why we can't do that. But but for people who've been in this a long time, sometimes it's easier to go to the, the 10 old white guys and just say, give me a little bit more and then just kind of, you know, kick the can down the road or, or kind of hide and say, oh, I'm just going to pretend all these other people aren't there. But I got to tell you, there's Gen Z people who are now giving and and we need to encourage that. That is our future. And it also means that the pie, when you look at the size, there's a lot of donors and a lot of people who gave it Giving Tuesday. 
But when you look at the size of that, it can be so much bigger if people, uh, if, if we if we realize that really everybody's a donor, there's a lot more people that give than we're aware of. You cannot silo people and say the volunteers go there and the donors go there. And, and if we listen to that, and I have sort of a whole methodology for it, uh, then I am certain that not only will the nonprofits in this uh, country do well and do better, but they're going to thrive long term. Yep. Yep. Okay. Let me let me turn to another um, topic. I mean, I you know you may as you know, Lisa, I'm the chair of the Joint Committee on the Arts, very closely connected to arts and culture institutions. A number of folks are actually on our Zoom right now who come from that sector. Um, yeah. There. Of course, the arts were devastated by the pandemic. I, I believe your book noted that older generations gave more to the arts, uh, likely more established arts organizations, and that although the arts are important, younger donor, donors are, are sometimes um, giving differently. So from your perspective and your research, why has giving uh, been flat for the arts, especially as our newer generations really seem to understand the, the value of creativity? I mean, the, the creative generation, right? I mean, yeah. you know, beyond the arts, uh, you know, to, to, to help society heal, rehabilitate, keep kids in school and more. I'd uh, love, love to kind of get your thoughts on that. And then, and then we can also um, get into your story in the book about, um, uh, you know, um, Felicia Mancini and her, her work with uh, Ms. Mr. Sure. Holland's Opus Foundation. For well, sure. Uh, so the, um, the reason why I think, uh, so I think for the last two years, I think initially, and I, I think the government subsidies helped this a ton, and this is why they were directed there. Initially, uh, it, I think it was an existential threat and people just thought, well, we want to make sure that people have food and they have housing and they have medical help and all of those kinds of things. So I think it was a knee jerk reaction for a while. But if you're looking at the bigger picture of over the last many years, it's really the same as what I've been describing in terms of the whole sector. It's really a lot of uh, the people on the list in the arts world are those same older people who have been giving to the arts forever. So I would assume that if I went to uh, one of the local, whatever, an opera or a large arts institution, they would, if I had done that at the very beginning when I was first giving, I also wouldn't have been on a list and I also wouldn't have been given the time of day. So I'm just a little example of what about these 618,000 millennial millionaires are better? What about the multiple millions of, of young people who want to give? And if they're turned off at the beginning, they may not have a culture of giving in their home. And so if they're turned off to it and they're told that someone's going to say, oh, no, the way we can tell you about our organization is we have to have a phone call and then we have to have a lunch, you know, and, and meanwhile, they're, you know, they're having protein shakes that they're, for their lunch at work. They don't go out lunches and they're not going to talk on the phone. If any of you with millennials know, they don't answer the telephone. So, so if you tell me those are the rules of the road to give, I am going to say, Unfortunately, not only am I not going to give to you, but I might not give at all. And I might put it in a donor advice fund and say, I'm just done. And that's really the, the scandal here. Um, you know, you're talking about, about format of, of the ask in the fundraising. Um, you know, you, you, you are not a huge fan of gala events, uh, at least from, from my read of your book. Um, you know, can you talk about why and how those events became such an important part of the fundraising circuit? Um, but then also give us your criticism um, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the potential pitfalls that you've run into, what sort of vetting a nonprofit should do before planning an in-person gala, right. uh, et cetera. So I think the galas were started by, um, again, another generation who thought it was a really fun thing to get dressed up and, 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 and see each other and talk about organization and have a really good feeling in the room. And by the way, I've been to my share of them. They're just not my favorite thing in the world. Um, but I, I would much prefer, I like just having a conversation with someone and giving or even giving without being solicited. So the sort of hard sell that might commit a gala. I also have a problem with, um, it's just my discomfort. This is not indicative. I don't think of the rest of the world, but, but asking me to buy a table or asking me to come to an event and pay money for that so that they can ask me for more money when I'm at the event. That feels very strange to me. And some people will say, if you paid a good enough amount, we're gonna give you a fun event. We're not going to ask you for more money. They might next week, but they won't there. Um, and and, and I, I think you know, some of them have been terrific. My biggest issue with them is that A, many of them are done now because they've been done for years and years and years ago. So uh, for years in the past. And so when you say, this is this assumption thing or this uh, it, it, it sort of, 
why do you do this event? You know, why do you do five galas? Why do you do whatever? And they'll say, the answer usually is because we always have. That's part of our regular calendar. Right. Why do you have to do an annual fund? Because that's part of our regular calendar. So, you know, and I'll say, July, you can do this. No, July, we have this on our calendar. And when you ask them why, it's been so long that many of them don't know why. So it's just because that's what we've always done. And I think with anything in life, if the answer, the only answer you can think of is that's the way we've always done it. And otherwise we don't know why, maybe you should look at that harder. My biggest concern about um, galas in general, and I think the virtual ones have been amazing. I just went to one two days ago that raised a boatload of money. Um, but, and I think the hybrid ones are, are also great. But I, coming from business, um, I will ask the people at the organization, you know, they'll usually say, we've all been to these events or seen them on, online, and they'll say, we made X amount of money. And I think, okay, that's great. So my first question, maybe it's because of, you know, my MBA training or whatever it is, but my first question without even thinking is, is that net or gross? And the answer I get is, I don't know. And then when I check into it, I find out it's usually gross, but if it is net, they have not taken into account all the hours that their staff had used to completely get ready for this thing. And in many cases, not be able to talk to other donors or millennial donors during that month or two or three months where they were planning. And nobody I've talked to, in, in, uh, even, if they, even if they pick a net amount, they still don't take the amount of time that was used for that purpose from their regular, uh, from their regular staff. Um, and, and so I would be much, much happier with galas if I knew that when somebody makes a big announcement and we've raised this much, just say this much gross or this much net or, or send something out three days later and say, guess what? We earn this much net because otherwise it feels a little, I don't know, bait and switchy. Um, okay. I, I agree with you on that. Um, uh, let me ask you a little, so we, we've got a couple of people who are posting in the chat who are from smaller mid-size organizations. Um, what sort of, and I know you've been, is that right? I, I think through, through the course of your having written this book, can you talk a little bit about um, some of these smaller mid-sized organizations that might not be as wedded to the old ways? Uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're trying to break through. Um, how, do they, how do they think outside the box, but also, um, but, but also break through when, when they may have a very specific model, um, when, 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 when they don't have the kind of infrastructural capacity, the same kind of name, it's not, it's not so much about, about changing their old ways so much as just trying to come up with a new way that's going to work yeah. and help them break through. Well, so I, I mean, I think I, I said a little bit before, don't do things only because that's the way you, you were told they were done. Do them because you understand and, you, and you, you, you support why they're done a certain way. So if someone feels uncomfortable asking for money in the way that, and this, you know, you can have one fundraiser doing everything. And if they, uh, and, and if they feel uncomfortable about it, they need to say, why do I feel so uncomfortable? We, you know, is there a way I could do this where I don't feel so uncomfortable? And so, I, I, and that's what I'm saying is there's lots of ways. It, the biggest message I have is just think about how you would feel if someone said those things to you. And so whether that's a small organization or large organization, you can do that. The benefit of a small organization is usually they're much, they're, they're more nimble and they can actually try new things and it's not going to have a giant impact. And there's not this you know, huge corporate 200 people, whatever, you know, who are making decisions kind of thing. And they can say, let's try this. And I, I think if you try doing things that, are, that, and you look at it as what would, if I was on the other side of that table, what would, what would inspire me? That's really what is going to, um, is going to work as opposed to, oh, the rule book says, I think we have to just think about the rule book and say, if it works for you, the stuff in the rule book, great. But if it doesn't work for you, let's find something better. And, and that's what I have in my book is a lot of that. Yeah, like you talk about the you know the ten by ten example, right? You know this pitch event. I mean, do you want to? Can you briefly describe that? Sure. Part? Yeah, there's a wonderful uh, a couple of people. This uh, guy who's a he's a wealth manager uh, during the day, but he started in Australia an organization called Ten by Ten. And what they do is they and I, I they've had several in Los Angeles and and throughout the world. And uh, what they do is they'll get ten people. Mostly it's younger people. But they, uh, they, they, he comes to town, he get, finds 10 people that he knows or knows somebody, and you have 10 people come to the event, but they all agree to be part of like the committee for the event. And those people all invite 10 people. And all of those people bring, I think it's, uh, I think they have to bring, it's, it's 50 or $100 and, uh, with, with them to kind of give to charities if they're so inclined when they get there. 
Uh, they get all of the uh, uh, food and drink. It's usually some hipster stuff. It's great. And it's all donated. Uh, and, and you go to these events and you see other people and it's fun. And what they do is they pick three organizations who do a little pitch, sort of like a Shark Tank thing, I guess, in a really nice way. Sometimes they have a video. And the people in the room, when you walk in, when you take your $50 or $100 and that gets turned into tickets. And so you get, uh, it's like each ticket is worth whatever, $10 or a dollar, whatever it is. And then you have these little booths on the side of the room that have uh, little booths and there's one for each of the organizations and somebody's there before and after and then during you're, you're doing the presentation. So based on the presentation, you go and you can ask questions and all. You then go to these little tables afterwards and you decide how many of the tickets you're going to put in each of their little bowls. And you could say, oh, I really like this one better. I'm going to give him all of it. But before he lets you leave and the people he's trained also do this, you cannot leave until you sit down and 10 people raise their hands that they're going to do the next one. And that's how he keeps it going. And it's been, it's all over the world. It's been fantastic. And it's, that's a whole good example of that's something new. I, that is, there's nothing about that that's the old way. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, and one of the things that's the heart there is really letting the donors engage. Um, you know, yesterday you and I had a prep call, um, as you recall. And, and, and I, I just want to, I want to flesh out a couple of things that we talked about, make sure that our audience gets a chance to, to hear some of your insights. You know, one of the things that one of the things that I found challenging, quite frankly, when I was running a nonprofit, was that we had a small, we had a model. Uh, it was a particular topic, and I was, you know, we were trying to get off the ground, and I was basically tasked with with going out there and trying to find as many people who'd be willing to give as possible. Um, but I didn't have, unlike, uh, you know, a bigger organization or a, or a better known organization where people would come to us. Uh, or, or, or a university, for example, that had a lot of different types of things that I could steer money toward. I had, we had a particular model and, and you know, certainly there was some flexibility within that model, some, but, um, but you, know, you, you talk about in the book and we talked yesterday about, about what do you do when you're, from a, when, you, when you're coming from an organization that doesn't have an answer for every single donor's possible interest because you, you're working mm -hmm. in one little space and yet you're, you're under all this pressure to raise money. Um, from as many people as you possibly can. Can, can you walk through uh, the, the trials and tribulations? And, and I'm hopeful through, as, you talk, as, you, as we talk about this, you're also going to get into some of the things you talk about in terms of authenticity and relationships right. And, right. Uh, that, that you talk so much about in the book. So it, it is all about authenticity. Um, I, 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 after several years of going through all of, all of this, dealing with all these different donors, I actually started to believe that fundraisers thought the donors were stupid because when I would say to them, what are your challenges? They would say, we don't have any, we're doing really well, our only challenge is money. I don't believe that. Or they, I would say to them, who's your competition? And they would say, I don't have any. You know, who do you partner with? Well, we don't need to. Those are all really bad answers. And if you were doing something, you know, the VC kind of thing, they would throw you out of the room. So that's just, it, but, it, but it makes it seem like, I know those answers can't be right. That just can't be right. They just don't wanna tell me. And so I think most people across the table will say, you know, hearing that will say something just doesn't feel authentic. Something doesn't feel real there. What is that about? And, and if you tell me that everything is hunky dory and we never have a problem, then, I, you know, I, other than money, I just say, you know, well, God, you sound like you're doing all right then. So I'm going to go to somebody else who, who really needs some help fixing something. Right. So I think it's about being super honest. It's about respecting that the other person at the other side of the table or who you're talking to you know, is also intelligent, probably has money because maybe, maybe has money because they were, they're intelligent and, 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 and certainly, you know, probably does some sort of business or investments and realize that, that those, those are kind of standard questions. Nobody else seems to ask them. I ask them all the time, but, but that's really, really um, important. But I think the most important thing is it's the authenticity. It's the understanding the other person looking at them as a human being and that all human beings are different. It's not, oh, I did a wealth engine, you know, wealth search and I found out you have X, Y, and Z. Therefore, I'm going to say X, Y, and Z to you. And there are organizations operating today, making money today that will give fundraisers a script based on that persona. And that's just unfair to everybody. And no one would want that done to themselves. But the other piece of it is that, as I told you yesterday, is that really, if, if the person who's asking, the fundraiser who's asking, really believes, body and soul, really believes in the mission of the organization, get that through to the person you're talking to. A lot of people I talk to say, oh, they don't care what I think. It's like, no, I want to follow you. If you have passion, I'm going to follow that passion. And by the way, that does also happen in business, right? But I want to see the passion that you have. 
And if it's somebody who goes from place to place, from nonprofit to nonprofit, and just to get a paycheck, I'm going to be able to see that and I'm less inclined to give. But if I can get into it with them, if I understand why they love it, and I am, and then I'll ask more questions. Oh my gosh, tell me about this amazing thing you did. And then the money part, most of the time I'll say, tell me what you need. And, and most people would do that. But I, but, it, but without that, the ask is just transactional. It's not a relationship. And, and the relationship is really the base of, of good fundraising and how people will want to do this long term. You know, uh, a question just popped up in the chat. Can you be too passionate? Um, <laughs> I think you could be obnoxious in the way that you, you convey that. I don't think you could be too passionate. I just think you would want to be tempered. And this is a part of having a relationship and based on social rules, right? If the person on the other side is very low key, you don't want to start screaming and being a cheerleader. So you want to kind of, I mean, a basic rule is you kind of match what their tempo is. But if you, so if you can do that, and, and show your passion that way, I think that it will, it will work as well as a, an authentic, honest interest in the other person and what they're about. And your idea is that in that conversation, you're trying to find, find that something that you're passionate about, they also are interested, at least interested in, if not passionate about. If the person isn't interested, let them go or recommend a place, you know, they're interested in dogs and you're pushing, you know, opera, then say to them, you know what, that's really, I, I totally understand that. And, and I'm not going to push you because that's not your thing. And if it ever happens, that is your thing. Hey, I'll send you some tickets or whatever. But, but I happen to know somebody at a dog organization that's really great. And when you send them over to that person and make that connection for them, they are more likely to actually just give to you because you've, you've, you've done that because you listen to them. You treated them like a human being and, and, they'll, and they're charitable because they're interested. So I think that is one of the best things that fundraisers could do. It's really kind of obvious, but yeah, common sense. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Um, do you have any helpful tips to nonprofits that are dealing with a very difficult, a generous, but very difficult donor? Yes, um, I, I, I think that it's one, that's one of the hardest things for nonprofits to do because very often you'll inherit a donor, right? You come to an organization, there's a donor that's been there for a while, or it's somebody that it's just so much money, it's gonna be, you know, it, it literally change the makeup of your organization, put you on a path to sustainability uh, because it's such a large amount of money. But if the person who's giving it is giving it for the wrong reasons or they're making demands, i.e., um, I knew somebody who gave money to a, a university, to a department of a university, and said it was a large amount of money and said, I'm going to give you this money, but I get to choose the textbooks. I get to look at the curriculum. I get to choose the teachers, the professors. And for me, that is that crosses the line and it's not okay. And I think that fundraisers need to, and it's not easy, but I think that fundraisers need to have as many donors as they can so that that one donor that makes those demands, they can just say, no, that's not how we operate. Okay, yeah. Well, it's it's a because I know that's a, that that content that 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 continues to be a, a an issue of some tension uh, for folks. But but uh, but you know, and I think I think one of the things you talk about continually in your book is how you do have to set your own terms. You have to protect yourself. I mean, there was a great story in your book about some crazy situation you'd had when you were on a yacht, and and the, and they were so they were so desperate to make sure that that, that you weren't having a bad experience. Uh, that they didn't even, they weren't sending the, the chef to the hospital who scalded himself, who desperately needed to go because there's this, this kind of attitude that people have when they're dealing with folks with resources that they can't possibly handle the real world. Um, and, um, and I think this happens in the nonprofit sector too. And, and as a result, um, nonprofit leaders end up kind of bending over backwards to meet, to meet these perceived needs of donors um, that, 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 that they really end up uh, harming their mission. So that's right. And if you had more donors, you wouldn't have to do that. It's because you have a select number of donors that you feel like you have to pander to those people. Yeah, exactly. 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 So anyway, listen, I, okay. So, so, okay. Let me say a couple things. Um, we are, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, Lisa is, is stepping in very, very thoughtfully into this space. And, and I just, I can't incur, I, I'm personally gonna get this book out to friends of mine in the philanthropic world, people on boards, um, because I do think that boards sometimes need to get out of their old school mindset with regards to fundraising. And I think they'll benefit a lot from reading this. And I think it will change the way they think about their fundraising activities and interact with their fundraisers. So, um, so that's one thing. Let me announce, 
um, we have, uh, we basically, we did a little lottery. I don't know how we did this, but um, my staff did this. Uh, we picked three, we, 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 Brad is my, my tech genius and, and um, kind of did some sort of randomization of our, of our participants. And so it turns out Janet Steinberg, Kimberly Parks and Sarah Anderson um, have all got through computer randomization, um, have been selected. Janet Steinberg, Kimberly Parks, Sarah Anderson, please direct message me or direct message Rad. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, um, please direct message Rad or Lauren Pizer Mains on the chat. Uh, Rad now Ruzi or Lauren Pizer Mains on the chat. If you are Janet, Kimberly, or Sarah, and and we will we will um, we will get you a signed copy of Philanthropy Revolution. Um, for everyone else, it's available on all of the typical sources. I believe it's available on Kindle as well. And I it also is. believe, um, I, I know this for a fact, it's on, it's on Audible too, because I, I read half of it by, in, uh, you know, on paper and half of it um, through listening. Uh, and there's a really great actress, uh, by the way, who, does, who, who reads the book and, and does it with a lot of flavor and, and verb. So I recommend the Audible version too, if you prefer to go through your books that way. So, uh, so, so that's, that's one thing. I know that Lisa is, is also interested in, 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 in helping um, uh, and, and making sure that the messages of her book, you, you get, get far and wide through the, the philanthropic world, the donor world, the board world, the fundraiser world. Uh, so, so please do um, get, get the word out. It's a, it's a fantastic book. She's got a great publicist who I had the chance to talk to yesterday as well, who, I, who is also happy to help. Um, let, let me ask you, uh, uh, Lisa, I know you've got some really great, um, uh, you've got, you've got kind of a, there, there are some ways for people to continually hear about what you're thinking. You had some, some yeah. tips. Yeah. Um, so on, on social media, I, I have a tip of the week. And if you just go to lisagreer.com, pretty easy, uh, just go to lisagreer.com and you will see all my tips of the week that I've done. They come out every Monday. Um, and those are just, you know, the Twitter sized tweets that, that we then also have on other social media. And then I have a publication, a blog called Philanthropy 451, and those come out about every 10 days or two weeks, and they're articles about uh, really kind of more contemporary things, whereas the book is a evergreen kind of thing. This is contemporary things and issues that come up and things that come up in the news. So you can register for it, you can subscribe for free, and the tips are free, and, uh, and please tell your friends. Um so that, so, okay, so, so check out the tips. Um, by the way, if you wanna do the old fashioned thing, and I, I very much encourage folks, um, Chevalier uh, Bookstore and Larchmont is selling the book. I'm sure there are bookstores all over uh, the district that are selling the book as well, but, but please do support small booksellers. Yeah, they actually sell the sign book. They're our exclusive partner for sign books. Yeah. The sign books, okay, fantastic. I, I, if people haven't been there, it's, it's such a cool little bookstore in, in Larchmont. Let me also say in the, in the spirit of holiday generosity, I'm actually gonna be hosting a donation drive in partnership with a, a whole series of nonprofits, uh, LA LGBT Center, um, Communities Child, the Momentum Pediatric Therapy Network, which is PTN's new merger down in the South Bay, a wonderful organization down in the South Bay. Um, so we're, we're getting, we're, we're collecting um, uh, toys and clothes and a number of other things. Uh, we'll post some information on, on the chat about our drive, but please join us. Uh, you know, we're, we're both collecting um, uh, in, in various locations, but uh, on Thursday evening, if you want to come from five to seven, we'll be having a collection drive at Santa Monica, Santa Monica High School Auditorium uh, from five to seven on Thursday. It's at, um, and it's a drive through, right? It's a drive through. It's a drive through. So old school. Yeah. Uh, so, so please do consider participating in that as well. And we'll see you there. Um, Rad has put the, uh, the registration information on, uh, on, on, on the, um, on the chat for folks, but, but Lisa, you know, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for all of your generosity to so many important and, and really worthy uh, nonprofits. I mean, one of the things you talk about in the book and one of the reasons why we have to get this book out is that unfortunately there aren't enough people who have, you know, we know a lot of people made a lot of money recently. I mean, all you got to do is take a quick look at the stock market. There are people who have a lot of money and yet only a certain portion of them have decided to take giving seriously. Some of them are socking it away and donor, you know, donor advised funds. And it just sits there as you've described in the book. Uh, sometimes people are not giving at all. Sometimes uh, it's because they haven't been engaged in the right way. And that's one of the re many reasons why I'm hopeful, hopeful that you're going to take your experience and get it out there and make sure that we continue to drive 
uh, philanthropic giving in our society. It's such an important part of the story. Just the other day, we were at a retreat, the LA County delegation, all the, all, you know, there's a part of me that, that feels weird about philanthropy because I feel like, you know, government should be taking care of a lot of this. But the truth is that for whatever reason, sometimes government isn't able to, it's not as nimble, it's not as available for certain types of things. Uh, philanthropy ha has a really important role to play. We just had this meeting actually with philanthropic leaders, the LA County delegation, the legislators who represent LA, and talk to them about ways that we can match the power of philanthropy, the nimbleness of philanthropy to help solve the homelessness crisis with, with the with resources and, uh, of government. Um, and, and it reminded me of how important a role philanthropy can needs to play sometimes. Sometimes government, for, for all sorts of reasons, whether it be regulatory, whether it be political, uh, government sometimes struggles to, to move in, in, in nimbly in the ways that it needs to help address big problems. And it reminded me of how important philanthropy is and how, how, how problematic it is that, that, may, that folks who have made so much money over the past few years are not engaging in the philanthropic sector. And I'm really hoping that your book will help to reinvigorate uh, that, that part of, our, uh, of uh, you know, that, that, that sector. Uh, and I think, I think your book holds that promise. Me too. Thank you so much. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. So thank you so much for everyone who joined us. Thank you, Lisa. Don't forget to check out the links we posted uh, before you sign off. Uh, if, if, if for whatever reason you want to access our slides or you want to be able to, uh, to, to get those links after this is done, uh, we're going to post this, this uh, in a couple of days once we get, get it cleaned up. So it'll be, on our, it'll be on our website, but also just feel free to contact our office uh, if you have any, uh, you know, if, if you want any additional, additional follow-up. So have a great week, safe, happy holidays. Hopefully see you Thursday or at other events. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so Thank much you. to all of the wonderful nonprofit folks who are on this call, who have been doing such a good job uh, uh, keeping the lights on during this, this difficult time. We know you're providing incredibly important services to our community and we just appreciate you as well. Thanks, take care. Bye everybody.